Tucker Carlson over at the Tucker Carlson Network did an interview with a pastor in the West Bank, a Palestinian pastor in the West Bank that made huge waves uh, sort of across the online right this week. I would just want to start with a clip from the interview and then we can get into why exactly people are so upset about it. So here's uh, Tucker Carlson with Isaac Munther, a Lutheran pastor, again, in the West Bank. If you wake up in the morning and decide that your Christian faith requires you to support a foreign government blowing up churches and killing Christians, I, I think you've lost the thread. It, it, just to, to end on this, if you had a message for Christian leaders in the United States, whether in government or in churches or just citizens who care about the religion and their fellow Christians, what would it be? It would be to remind them that when the state of Israel was created, it was not created on an empty land. It was created on a land that had uh, millions of indigenous Palestinians there, including Palestinian Christians. And that that state they support, uh, that state they celebrated as a fulfillment of prophecy and a sign of God's state to the Jewish people for it to become a state. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, including Palestinian Christians, uh, were forced to leave and have never returned. There is a very, very brutal war taking place in Gaza, a war that I described using the word genocide because it's a war that has used even starvation as a mean. And fellow Christians are suffering because of that war. Father, thank you for your thoroughly decent and sensible analysis, and I hope it's heard by Christians throughout the West. Okay, so again, the key Tucker Carlson quote there, if you wake up in the morning and decide your Christian faith requires you to support a foreign government blowing up churches and killing Christians, I think you've lost the thread. That could also obviously be applied to the United States in the Cold War era. We talk about El Salvador and all of that, but just sticking here for now, uh, it's worth noting, there's so much to kind of break down from this, but it's worth noting that, so I grew up Missouri Synod Lutheran, it's in the United States a more conservative denomination of Lutheranism than Evangelical Lutheranism, uh, ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. This denomination of Lutheranism in the Holy Land is, it's worth, again, saying more liberal, this particular, um, uh, th so the, the person that Tucker Carlson interviewed actually was you know, sort of championing the ordination of women, like kind of a progressive denomination, mm -hmm. progressive version of Lutheranism, which is an interesting kind of crossover with Tucker Carlson finding common cause on that question of Christian persecution. There are about 3,000 um, of his denomination Lutherans in Gaza. There are 47,000 Christians, at least that was as of 2017. I'm sure that number has gone down. Um, so that's all, he also went viral last year, which some people may remember. Crystal, I think you remember this. Yeah. He had this viral sermon, Christmas sermon. That's right. Where he said, if Jesus were to be born today, he would be born under the rubble in Gaza. He gave a, a sort of homily around Christmas where he said, Christ in the, the rubble, a liturgy of lament. That was the title of the service. Uh, here's another quote from him. People keep leaving because of the political reality. Life under a very harsh Israel, Israeli military occupation is difficult to bear. And as a result, many young Palestinian Christians continue to leave. For example, Bethlehem, that's where one of his churches is, one of the churches he leaves, leads, choosing to find a better and easier life elsewhere. Now, uh, in the best, the so I'm trying to put the best faith approach to Tucker's critics here, and I don't think this. I, I think this is probably a strange interview, probably not the best interview for Tucker, uh, but his critics of him just having this conversation with this Lutheran pastor. Um, you know, they said this particular pastor was championing Hamas because they pulled this clip of him uh, in an address on October 9th uh, saying, you know, one of the scenes that left an impression on my mind yesterday, and there are many scenes, is the scene of Israeli youth who were celebrating a concert in the open air just outside the borders of Gaza and how they escaped. What a great contradiction between the besieged poor on the one hand and the wealthy people celebrating as if there was nothing behind the wall. What is happening is an embodiment of the injustice that has befallen us as Palestinians since the Nakba until now. He also said in that address, we do not justify our support the killing of civilians or the abuse of corpses or prisoners. War is always ugly, but the hypocrisy of the world is something truly harmful. Today we are called first to pray. Pray for the war to stop. Pray for protection for the innocent. Every human being who dies is a human being created in the image of God. God does not rejoice in death, and we do not rejoice in death. But because he says things like Israeli occupation, mm -hmm. I think he referred to the siege at one point. Yeah. Um, you know, it's obvious that he's coming from a 
what we in the United States would categorize as a leftist position on this particular question. It's, it's obvious. But to say that Tucker Carlson should not interview and should not have expressed any sympathies for someone coming from that perspective who lives it every day in Bethlehem, uh, which is a very uh, contested territory, to say that his perspective is not worth hearing out in the United States and there's no reason for somebody to express sympathy with that position, I think is actually really unfortunate and speaks to the way that we have just, even on the right, created these um, blocks uh, and these bubbles that it's just you cannot even ask questions uh, without being categorized by some people. You know, there's some really good faith disagreement on this, and I would disagree with some of what Tucker Carlson said in that interview myself. We have to be able to talk about some of these things, though, because there are more than 40,000 Christians in Gaza. Yeah, and um, that is a very uncomfortable fact, I think, for people who are just lockstep. Anything Israel does is fine. Um, there's also, obviously, a religious view. I mean, the the religious group that has the most favorable view of the Netanyahu government is not Jewish Americans. It's white evangelical Christians. Um, so Michael Tracy actually tweeted this out, and I thought this was well said. He said, Palestinian Christians are the most cognitive dissonance-inducing demographic for the pro-Israel GOP consensus. Many GOP voters literally do not even know that they exist. That's why the pro-war cheerleaders are reacting so angrily to Tucker simply interviewing one of them. Um, with regard to uh, this pastor, you're right, I was familiar with, I saw his Christmas sermon, which was beautiful and went viral and I think, you know, spoke to humanity. I wouldn't say it was left-wing. I would say it was pro-humanity. In fact, some of the messaging in it was rather conservative, talking about the commercialization of Christmas and how Christmas this is not about like Santa and a tree and gifts. It's about the, the message of Jesus. Um, I saw another sermon of his that went viral as well. So he's been a very powerful voice. He lives in Bethlehem under Israeli occupation, surrounded by settlements and having to deal with all that that entails. Um, and the Christian population of Bethlehem, and this is one of the things that was really, I think, contested in some of the reaction has um, significantly diminished, and the reason is quite clear. There's a lot of polling on this. 78% uh, of Christian residents of Bethlehem cited Israel's occupation as the main reason why they moved away. Only 3% blamed the rise of Islamic movements like Hamas, because this was some of the pushback. It's like, oh, well, Bethlehem used to be mm -hmm. you know, predominantly Christian, and it's not anymore, and it's because of this uh, these Muslim fundamentalists. Well, according to the Christians who moved out of Bethlehem, this is E3, by the that's way. not the case. Um, they moved away because they were living under occupation and all of the like indignities and inhumanities that that entails. This was uh, written up by Electronic Intifada, but it was a you know a nonpartisan organization that did the polling here. That it was like Zogby, yeah. yeah, yeah. Bethlehem surveys show support for town of Christ's birth and confusion over its location. They also um, interviewed Americans who were pretty confused over what exactly was going on in Bethlehem. But that key data about seventy eight percent saying it was Israel's occupation is the reason that. They they left. And in addition, you know, obviously you have had um, churches under assault in the Gaza Strip. In fact, you had two Christian women, a mother and daughter, who were sniped and killed uh, in the early days of this conflict. We covered it here. I don't know if you all recall that or not. But the IDF disputes it, which is also became an issue in this whole viral conflict. Okay, well, Shireen Abu Akhlid, by the way, I personally, Christian. I personally believe the eyewitness, eyewitnesses who were on the ground versus the IDF who lies all the time, but And yes. a, a, one of the oldest churches, maybe the oldest church actually in Gaza was bombed and lots of Christians died there earlier in the war. Shireen Abu Akhle was Christian, mm. was Christian. The Al Jazeera journalist, obviously the IDF story changed on her. Well, um, they admitted they killed her though. Yes, ultimately they admitted. And again, the, she was a Christian, a uh, Palestinian Christian. And, and they attacked- she's American too. Uh, they attacked um, mourners at her funeral as well, if people recall, but- And so if we can't even talk about this, like, that's a little ridiculous. Yeah, and, and even the, you know, the pushback, oh, this, you know, this pastor, he said X or Y or Z. I, listen, I don't know every word that this man has uttered and whether I co-sign that or not, but that doesn't really rebut 
what he's saying, what Tucker's arguing here. And the comments I saw that he made about October 7th, you know, I tried to gingerly and very carefully make some similar remarks about the festival goers. This is not in any way to sanction their murder, which was horrifying, which was an outrageous, indefensible atrocity. I'm not denying that. I would never deny that. But there was something that was worth commenting on about the fact that so close to the Gaza Strip, this open air prison, you had people who were going about their lives as if that was completely invisible. And that was the overall reality of Israeli society prior to October 7th, was this idea that we can just keep these people out of sight, out of mind. We can go ahead with normalization, with Saudi Arabia, with other Gulf Arab states. We can just pretend they don't exist. And Netanyahu would say things like, you know, I can control the the height of the flame. They would go in for these mowing of the lawn operations every now and again. But for your average Israeli, they never really had to come into contact with Palestinians. So that seemed to me more what he was commenting on. But again, even if he said something about October 7th that I genuinely objected to, that does not undercut the argument that's being made now. Now, the other thing I would say is that, you know, with regard to to Tucker and choosing this particular issue to Mm. push on and focusing only on Christians, as opposed to the many, many more tens of thousands of Muslims who have been slaughtered in Gaza— You know, the most charitable interpretation is kind of the Michael Tracy one of like, he knows this is the one that's the most difficult for the right to deal with. But, you know, the uncharitable interpretation is like, well, you only care about the Christians. You don't care about all of humanity that is suffering in Gaza right now, the little, you know, Muslim babies who are being starved to death, et cetera. But um, I'll give it to Tucker. He sure knows how to stir the pot, and that's for sure. Speaking of which, yeah, we can just quickly give everyone a flavor of the backlash. Uh, Put E2 up on the screen. Uh, One critic of Tucker uh, who said— Quote, uh, there is no one in America, American life who thinks less of Christians than Tucker. He doesn't like Jews, but he at least doesn't think we're stupid. Even Trump's Bible selling is transparently transactional. Uh, Tucker's entire shtick relies on this belief that Christians are gullible, sap, gullible saps. That's from a senior editor over at Commentary mm-hmm. Magazine. Uh, by the way, I mean, Tucker has very openly in the last couple of years talk, uh, talked about be- going much deeper into his own faith personally, which I- I've heard him do it at events. It's it's a very compelling story, and it's actually a very honest story. So I, I sort of take issue with that uh, mm. point that there's no one in American life that thinks less of Christians than, than Tucker Carlson. Uh, here's a tweet from David M. Friedman. Uh, this is the next element we can put up on this the screen. This was Trump's ambassador to Israel, so particularly noteworthy that he— made this commentary. Yes, he said, uh, Tucker, my friend, before the Palestinians took over Bethlehem, pursuant to the Oslo Accords of the mid-1990s, Bethlehem was under Israeli control and its population was 80% Christian. It was one of the centers of the Christian world. Since Oslo and the resulting Palestinian rule, Bethlehem became 80% Muslim and Christians are afraid, but they don't speak out against the Palestinian Authority because you just can't survive. You know, this is an interesting point because you talk about the Yazidis, you could talk about, uh, I mean, you could you could go into a lot from that point, but it's also just this idea that because Tucker interviewed this pastor, he doesn't believe that there are also uh, Muslim persecutions of Christians. Like, that happens too. Mm-hmm. Like, it, he's not saying it doesn't. That's true. And so it's just this, uh, this is what I meant earlier about the boxes and the bubbles, that like, if he asks questions, he's immediately categorized with this full suite of opinions that he may or may not hold. But in this case, it's very likely that he would never dispute that. Um, in a million years, he would never dispute that because he talks about it frequently. Uh, you know, the, the sort of like what's happened in, in Paris and different places in Europe. So I just, it's very frustrating. Um, but that's also, I guess, the nature of Twitter. We can put uh, this next tweet up on the screen from Dan Crenshaw, uh, Sagar's best friend, Dan, Cren- Dan Crenshaw. He took the opportunity to say, this is who Tucker is, a click chaser. Tucker's MO is simple, defend America's enemies and attack America's allies. Again, just <laughs> immediately prescribing to him this full suite of opinions because, and and Crenshaw then uh, mocks the idea that you're just asking questions. I would really prefer that people did just ask questions as opposed to people just swallowing the line that Dan Crenshaw feeds them. Look, I don't have a high opinion of Tucker Carlson, but you have to deal with like what he's actually laying out here and not just be like, oh, he's just chasing clicks. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just cheap and easy. 
To go back to the Friedman uh, comments about, oh, uh, Bethlehem was under Israeli control, its population is 80% Christian. Um, he says that resulting Palestinian rule is why Bethlehem mm-hmm. became 80% Muslim and Christians are afraid. This goes back to the polling that I had before. Yes. That's just not yeah. true. If you ask the people that left, that's not the Muslim rule was, what did I say, 3% said that uh, the rise of Islamic movements like Hamas were the reason that they left. 78% said it's because of Israeli occupation. And even if if you put the West Bank aside, you look at what's happening in Gaza, like Christians are being killed, their churches are being attacked. These things are undeniable. So, you know, a lot of, and you hear this not just with regard to Christians, but you hear this with regards to other minority groups within Israel outside of the occupied territories. Was, oh, well, you know, if you're a Muslim in uh, Israel, you'd rather be a Muslim, you have more rights there than in many other countries in the Middle East. But they never want to talk about people who are living under occupation, under this apartheid system. Yes, if you are a small minority group that does not threaten the demographic majority, they'll you'd be okay. But then if you say, okay, we'll just extend those rights to the Palestinians who are living in the West Bank and in Gaza, uh, can't do that. And, you know, to your point, Emily, about the um, about more universalist values, like I have no interest in and am opposed to Muslim fundamentalist governments, and I am uh, opposed to Jewish fundamentalist governments and Christian fundamentalist governments. And, you know, that's I believe in the pluralism and secularism that we have at our best here in America. And that is across the board and not subject to, you know, the my feeling about one religion or another religion. By the way, a lot of the Chinese nationals coming over the border right now say they're Christians who are seeking asylum here because of religious persecution in China. And so I think it's just another great illustration of how sometimes our uh, reflexive categorization. And, you know, we have different opinions on what's happening at the border, but um, we, we so many, like, human stories just get lost in that categorization that's fueled by places like Twitter. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber-funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So, again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.